Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Quarantine. We're excited to see you, and we have some fun chemistry for you today. But first, we're going to do a little slideshow, and we're going to show you something that we're doing today that's a little bit different. So we're trying out something new. We are going to, in the first hour, we're going to have a little art showcase that way. We're going to have an art showcase showing you the fantastic art submissions that we received. Then we're going to do a science demo, and it's elephant toothpaste today, which I know is a super fun reaction that some of you have seen before. We'll have fact or fiction, a math game, our engineering challenge, and a math puzzle. That's going to be our first hour. And then for our second hour, we're going to go a little deeper. So we'll do another quick art showcase. We'll do what's in the bag. Then we're going to explain in more detail some of the science behind elephant toothpaste. We'll have three jokes. Math dad's got a lesson. We'll have five questions, and then at the end, we're going to let you guys pick what song Math Dad sings, but it has to be one he knows the words to. <laughs> <laughs> so that is our schedule that we're trying today, and I'm curious to know what you think after we, after we do today's lesson. If you like the two-hour format where we sort of break it where the first hour is a little bit simpler and the second hour is a little more advanced, let us know what you think. Do you have anything you want to say before we check out some awesome art? Oh, no, I'm excited for the art. Bring it on. All right, so I am going to share my screen and then we're going to bring up a slideshow. And I'm actually, whoop, come on, play for me. I'm actually going to start at the bottom and work up because we had such fantastic submissions with our Da Vinci bridges from yesterday. Oh, Isn't that incredible? So we had several where they had really big weights that they were on this one that's a 50 ounce can <laughs> and the pencils are holding it can you believe it and there's not like some hand at the top holding that there were multiple pictures of this where you could see that that can totally free freestanding look we've got infinity cubes on top of a da vinci bridge <laughs> we've got six pounds on a da vinci bridge made out of pencils so you guys did a fantastic job with this engineering challenge and if you took a picture and want to share it with our community you can post it under the prompt in our facebook page then let's do some cards now. So this one is raining toilet paper, which I thought was hilarious <laughs> and very, very appropriate to the, the interesting shortages that we've had recently with, with our, our quarantines. And then we've got raining science over here. I love that one. Looks like a highway. It, it, yeah. This one, Frozen 2. Oh, so cute. And look, look there's a little that the little fire lizard gecko yeah. gecko guys there. I love the watercolor feel of this one. Beautiful artwork. And we have an umbrella for a, a horse here. Oh, these are so fantastic. <laughs> if you notice there are puddles, that's because when the fire droplets land, they turn into water. But if they land on something other than ground, then they will burn whatever they land on. Oh, a firestorm. That's, so we, that's why we need umbrellas. That is that's why we need umbrellas. And so we've got two firestorms here, a dragon raining down fire and fire falling. Love it. And this one, this one made me laugh. Do you recognize that song that they've got written there, Math Dad? I'm singing a song, but I don't know the words. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's a, a good song. And it's raining math in this one. Oh. Math Dad likes that one. Whoops. It looks like, here, I'm going to exit real quick. I will I will come back to that later. It looks like maybe the the file wasn't quite saved. So we're going to, we'll come back to another another math or picture showcase at the end. But now it is time well, for our science lesson. I, I've got to say something, though. So, so yeah. these, these pencil bridges that are holding a lot of weight, pencils, they're not as strong even as a, a normal stick. So one day... My, one evening we had kind of a family night gathering and my, my mom wanted to teach us a lesson about how individually we're, we're not as strong, but as a group, we're much stronger. So she pulled my older brother over and said, here, break this pencil. So he, he broke it, snapped it. And then she's like, ah, maybe you can do two. So he snapped two pencils. And then she got out this whole handful of pencils and was like, ah, but right, can, can you, you do this, these? Yeah, can you and break these? Ah, he just snaps them all, and my mom, ah! <laughs> it's a 
first of all, it ruined a, a lot of good pencils. <laughs> Made them into very short pencils. Yes, yes. yes. But also, uh, yeah, it totally demolished her lesson because uh, it, it turned <laughs> out that even United, we, we weren't enough to, to withstand that. So and the older brother. Yep. Yep. So <laughs> pe pe pencils are not, not as tough as regular sticks. But if you arrange them the right way and the weight is distributed in that arch, it's amazing how much weight they can support. That's yeah. what I love about the Da Vinci Bridge. All right. Our science lesson today is elephant toothpaste and chemical reactions. And yesterday we talked a little bit about chemical reactions, how when you put two things together in a chemical reaction, you get a new product. And the reaction that we're talking about today is pretty cool because it's one that will actually happen on its own. And the molecule that we're looking at is hydrogen peroxide. That is H2O2. And if you go to the store and look for hydrogen peroxide, you'll see that it is always in a dark brown bottle. And have you ever wondered how come this one is always in a dark brown bottle, hydrogen peroxide, but something like rubbing alcohol is in a clear bottle? Why don't they put this one in a clear bottle? Well, there's a reason for it. And the reason is that hydrogen peroxide is not stable. On its own, if you just leave hydrogen peroxide alone, it will break down into water and oxygen. So. H2O2 might remind you of H2O. It looks real similar. There's just one extra oxygen. And of course, this is an unbalanced equation, but just to sort of simply illustrate what happens, it splits apart and you get water and oxygen gas. This will happen on its own without any extra help, but it doesn't happen very fast. And it will happen faster if you add light. And that's why these bottles are always dark brown because if this bottle was clear and light could come through, then your hydrogen peroxide would be breaking down a lot faster. And if you have ever used hydrogen peroxide, opened it up, used some, and then put the lid back on and come back a lot later, let's say you come back like five months later, and then you take the hydrogen peroxide and maybe pour it on a scrape, there are no bubbles, or you go to clean with it and it doesn't seem to be working, that's because it's no longer hydrogen peroxide, it's water. And that's happened to us before. We've had bottles of hydrogen peroxide that have been left in the cupboard for too long. And then when we go to use them, I'm like, hmm, this is no longer hydrogen peroxide. It has all turned into water because this is a reaction that will happen just on its own. Hydrogen peroxide is not a very stable molecule, but there's something we can do to make it go faster. Because if I pour hydrogen peroxide, in fact, let me, let me just get our first part set up here real quick. I'm going to pour hydrogen peroxide into our bottle and you guys can see that it's going to look a lot like water. So as we start pouring it in, that looks pretty much like water coming into our jar. I'll hold it up a little bit higher so that you can see. And if I told you, guess what? There's a chemical reaction happening right now. We're producing oxygen gas. You would not be very impressed because it is happening too slowly and we really don't see anything going on. And I'm gonna ask Math Dad to continue to pour that in until we get up to about this line right here, because it's going just a little bit slowly. And then I'm going to show you, here, you can stand right over there. I'm going to show you what we need to make it go faster. Because with a lot of chemical reactions, there is something that you can do to make it go faster, and that is to use a catalyst. Now, our catalyst that we're going to be using today is a fungi. And I'm not talking about a fungi like a funny guy, but fungus, like a mushroom. And the fungus that we're using is yeast. If you have ever used yeast before, you know that it looks kind of sandy, like little tiny, little tiny particles. But if you pour it in water, then it foams up a little bit and it smells. It smells kind of like like bread. If you've ever made pizza dough before or made homemade bread, then you'll recognize this smell. So we're gonna pour our yeast in. You can see it looks kind of sandy. That's good. And now what I need to do is stir it around and hydrate it. And you know what, Math Dad? I forgot to get a spoon, but that's all right. I've got a popsicle stick. So we will stir our yeast into the water and get it nice and hydrated. The yeast is actually alive. It is a type of fungus, but it's a small type of fungus. It doesn't form a mushroom or anything like that. It's tiny little cells that when they have sugars and other things that they can eat, they 
they split apart and form new yeast cells, and then those ones split apart and form new yeast cells. And it's a super important thing for us for a lot of different foods. We use yeast and other little microscopic organisms to make yogurt, to make cheese, to make bread, and all sorts of things. So now that we have our yeast all stirred into the water, it's awake and it's ready to act as a catalyst. But there's something else that we want to add to our elephant toothpaste. Right now, we have our hydrogen peroxide in here, and if we waited for maybe about a week, it would all turn into water and the oxygen gas would just go up into the air. But if we're waiting a week for this to happen, that's gonna be a pretty boring reaction to watch because we're not gonna be able to really see any bubbles. If we add our yeast, it will happen a lot faster. But I also want to add some soap because if we add soap, then we can capture that oxygen gas as it comes out. So I'm gonna put a squirt of soap in. And I'm not doing exact measurements, but on your worksheet, I did put measurements. So if you want to have, have measurements that you follow where you're following an exact recipe or an exact protocol, then look on the worksheet and I've got measurements there, but for, for doing it here, I'm just kind of eyeballing it. And I've done it enough times that I know that this will, this will work. So we've got our hydrogen peroxide mixed with soap now so that we can capture those bubbles. And now I'm going to turn the view so that you guys can see the little setup we have here. And we're gonna add our catalyst. Turn down here. Oh, and I need to ask Math Dad, will you get a funnel for, for me? We have a funnel in, in that Tupperware right there. There should be a funnel. Food coloring is not at all required for this, but it's just more fun if we add food coloring. So I'm going to add some green to our bottom, to the liquid down here, and then I'm gonna put red and blue stripes around the, the rim. So you're getting some questions. Is it okay to drink hydrogen peroxide? Ooh, these are good questions. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about hydrogen peroxide as soon as we do this, but I'll answer that one while I'm, while I'm getting the food coloring. Hydrogen peroxide, if it all depends on the concentration, it really does. So this hydrogen peroxide here, you will see this type that you get at the store. If you look at the bottom, it says 3%. Usually it says on the front, sometimes it says on the back. There we go, on the back, 3% hydrogen peroxide. That means that 97% of this is water and only 3% is H2O2. If you were to, to drink or to put 100% hydrogen peroxide on your skin, it would cause really bad damage immediately because it is, it is a reactive chemical. 3% hydrogen peroxide is pretty safe. People will pour that onto scrapes and some people will gargle with it or brush their teeth with it and it's gonna be fine. I don't recommend actually drinking it, but if you wanna use it like to brush your teeth or rinse out your mouth, it fizzes up and some people, some people like that. And it, it is safe at that concentration. Anytime we're talking about safety with a chemical, you've got to be talking about what the dose is. The difference between medicine and poison, a lot of times is just the amount, the dose. So that, that's, that kind of sounds a lot like a no though. Like yes. you probably shouldn't do don't it. Don't drink hydrogen peroxide. That is what I'm saying, don't drink it. So cleaning with it, brushing your teeth with it, sure. Um, rinsing off a scrape with it, yes, that's fine too, but don't drink it. That's what I'm saying. Thank you, Math Dad, for that clarification. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Bye. <laughs> All right, we have our blue stripes around the top, and I think perhaps we want to turn off that um, the light on the side just because it might we might be able to see better without it that reflection there. Let's try it and see if that gives us a better, I think that's a little bit better. And then I'm going to bring you just a little closer so that you have a good view. And now we're ready to add the catalyst. So three, two, one. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Add the catalyst. And you can see that we have bubbles being formed and these bubbles are coming up. They're gonna go out the top and this is why it's called elephant toothpaste. This one's a little bit more energetic than, than typical, but if I, I'll try and turn it to the side real quick so you guys can see that foam and that column of foam is like, nope, I'm gonna go behind where they can't see it. Just don't drop it. There we go. So you can see the way it's coming out, it really does look sort of like a giant container of toothpaste. 
Maybe if we just tip it this way, then it will come. There we go. Now it's going to come around front. Doesn't that look like a big bottle of toothpaste being squeezed? This is a super fun reaction. The thing that I really like about doing this recipe with 3% hydrogen peroxide is that our products are really safe. So what we have here is oxygen gas, soap, and water. That's pretty much it. Now, if you have really sensitive skin, I don't recommend putting your fingers into the foam because the tiny trace amounts of hydrogen peroxide that might still be there might irritate your skin just a little bit. But if you don't have really sensitive skin, if you're not often getting rashes, then this foam is very safe to touch and play with. And it feels slightly warm. And Math Dad's over it, it here like... just about ready it's to, about to spill. spill over the end of the cookie sheet. Here. All right, Math Dad, be a hero and take that to the sink. All right, open the door. <laughs> there we go. So that is elephant toothpaste. And I will answer a few quick questions about that before we we finish up and get ready to go into our fact or fiction. So one, one question that, that I often get asked is, what, what happens if you don't add soap? If you don't add soap, you will actually see some bubbles coming up, but they will be much larger and they will not be as thick and they usually don't come out all the way. The yeast itself, yeast has some a chemical in it that is somewhat similar to soap. And so just by pouring the yeast in, you will capture some of the gas, but not enough to have it come out and be all foamy. And another person asked, why does um, hydrogen peroxide bubble when you put it on a cut? That is a great question. And it's because the there is something called an enzyme. An enzyme is something that speeds a reaction up and, that's, and a catalyst is almost always an enzyme. And so our, our catalyst, or our enzyme, you can call it either one, is in the yeast, and it's something that is called catalase, which confuses a lot of people because catalyst is applies to lots of different enzymes, and catalase is a particular type of enzyme that takes hydrogen peroxide and breaks it into water It makes and oxygen. It makes that happen really fast. So yeast has that enzyme, but you do too. Every single one of your cells has that same enzyme that yeast does. And so if hydrogen peroxide touches part of you that is alive and living, a cell that's alive and living, living, then you will get bubbles. But, and here's kind of a cool fact, the skin that is on, the cells that are on the outer layer of your skin, they're actually not alive, they're dead. And so when you pour hydrogen peroxide onto your skin, that outer layer of protection that you have, those outer skin cells that are all dead, they're not gonna have catalase, they're not gonna react. But if you have a scrape, then that scrape has removed that top layer of dead skin and you're down to cells that are alive. And catalase is kind of like a, it's your body's way of being like, uh-oh, uh-oh, we don't want hydrogen peroxide. We don't want free little oxygen molecules running around to damage our DNA. And it immediately attacks the H2O2 and breaks it apart into water and oxygen. Great question. I'm gonna check real quick to see if there are a couple other questions about elephant toothpaste. That was really surprising. I, I did not know that. You did not know that? Math Dad no. did not know that. Learn something new every day. Can you use that elephant toothpaste to brush your teeth? Yuck. Soap does not taste very good. And this would taste very soapy because we put quite a bit of soap in it. So I would say I would not recommend brushing your teeth with with, with the elephant toothpaste foam. That would taste really bad. Can you have just one color on it? You can do any type of colors you want. I like to put some food coloring around the top just because it then gives some stripes as the foam comes out, but you can use any type of any type of colors that you want, or you can do it without colors. But the foam tends to be a little bit more white because of the way that the bubbles trap the gas as they come up. And so whatever color you do use when the foam comes out, it'll be a lot lighter. Good question. Will Mentos, oh, this is a good question. Will Mentos make hydrogen peroxide explode? They will not. Mentos work by taking um, a carbonated beverage, something that already has a lot of dissolved carbon dioxide gas in it, and just making a way for that dissolved gas to form bubbles and come out. But when we see that reaction happening with elephant toothpaste, it's different. We don't have dissolved gas inside here. There, is, there isn't a lot of dissolved gas inside this hydrogen peroxide. What we have 
is H2O2, this big molecule here that is not stable. It's like, oh, I don't know if I'm very stable. And it is going to break apart into water and oxygen. So that's what our yeast does. Oh, so this, I happen to know this fact, so I'm, I'm going to jump in. This oxygen isn't the air you breathe. It, it, it's usually got to be two molecules yes. together. So science mom said this wasn't a balanced equation, it's and that's not. because it doesn't break <clears throat> into even parts. So just, just to keep it simple, I just split this guy apart. But really, whenever one of these splits, this oxygen immediately finds another oxygen and makes O2, which is the oxygen that we breathe. And then you get multiple multiple water molecules made and multiple oxygen molecules made. Good, yeah, good so point. If you ever take a chemistry class, you'll learn how to balance those types of things. Yes. And we will get into a few more details about, about that reaction in our second hour. But I think now we're ready for fact or fiction. <clears throat> So, and, oh, and I, I did see someone ask oh. about the egg. We will we will update you and show you the egg after we do fact or fiction. All right. So somebody did ask a pretty good question. What if you put the cap back on the bottle? Don't put the cap on the bottle. If you put the cap back on the bottle, pressure will build up and you could end up exploding your bottle and you could get hurt because the, the bottle that I was using, a soda bottle, they're made to hold carbonated beverages. That means they can withstand a lot of pressure. And then when they do break, that can be dangerous. So do not put the lid on the bottle. But if you wanted to get a higher fountain, if you put a lid on the bottle that had a hole drilled in it and make sure that if you do this, you do it outside, it will go It will go very high. We did that, do you remember for science camp when we did that? I, I do remember I ran that. a science camp out of my house several years ago and we, we did that. So we had all these bottles that had a hole in the middle and then you'd pour your yeast in, you'd screw the lid on real fast and then you'd stand back because with that smaller opening, it would go up really high. Did we have a higher concentration of hydrogen peroxide? For one of the demos I did, I did get 33% or 35% hydrogen peroxide, but that was only for an outdoor demo that I was very careful with. And I had on very big gloves and I had on face, you know, eye protection because the 35% hydrogen peroxide is very concentrated and the foam that it makes is really, really hot. So if you see this elephant toothpaste and you're thinking, why doesn't that look like the videos on YouTube where you see the foam like shoot up to the ceiling all of a sudden? It's because of the concentration. 3% hydrogen peroxide versus 35% hydrogen peroxide. And if you're using the 35, you got to be really careful. All right. That makes sense. Fact or fiction. Are you ready, Math Dad? I'm ready. Today I'm going to get them all right. Today is the day. <laughs> and as I mentioned before, we do have a handout for each episode of Quarantine. And if you printed it out, printed it out then you had a chance to do some research too. And I'm curious, Math Dad might be asking for your help. And if you want in the chat, you can give him hints. So fact right. or fiction, killer whales are actually dolphins. Oh my goodness. I don't think they're dolphins. So, so, so I think they're mammals. They are mammals. But I don't think they're dolphins. But I, and not, I don't know where the dolphin family begins or ends, but I think it does not begin with or end with, with killer, killer whales. whales. That's, that's what I'm saying. Orcas yeah. are not dolphins. You should have been looking at the chat. Everyone's like, it's true. Fact. It is true. The, what? So when we when we talk when we say the word dolphin, usually most people are just thinking about like the bottlenose dolphin. Like, and that's that's all they think about. But dolphin actually refers to a very large family of marine mammals, more than 30 species, including pilot whales and orcas, and a couple, yeah, several others that I had never even heard of before. But so Whales usually are not in the family. Are they, they different? Well, whale whale is not like a real, mm. that's a common term. It's not like the scientific term for a particular species. But somehow dolphin is? Because there's a whale shark, but the whale shark isn't even a mammal, right? Well, yeah. But... So dolph dolphin is also a common term that is, you know, it's broader than, than most people think. So killer whales actually are a type of dolphin. All right, all right. Which is kind of cool. That is. Yeah, and all dolphins are mammals. They're all highly intelligent, and they are all carnivores too. They eat fish. Now you know. No, no, now I know. Okay, that was all a right. warm up. That one didn't count. That was a warm up. You ready for your next one? Ready. Ninety percent of the food that humans eat come from just thirty plants. Ninety percent of the food humans eat come from thirty plants. I, I that sounds really plausible because. 
I mean, I, I think if, if you go with rice and corn and we got wheat and potatoes, yeah. like I, I, I bet those four alone have to make up a, a huge portion. Two thirds. Two thirds, just those yeah. four. Yeah, right? no, j just those three. Rice, wheat, and corn make up two thirds oh, okay. of our calorie consumption for yeah humanity as a whole, which is kind of amazing. So if you want to read more about that, look up staple crops, staple food crops. It's kind of amazing how those few super crops really just dominate the food chain in an incredible way. And I have to say, like having my, my bachelor's degree is in crop science. And so it made my little agriculture loving heart very happy that you got that one right. Good job, Math Dad. Oh, thanks. So we, we used to watch these uh, nature documentaries by uh, Attenborough. And he, he did this whole series on plants. But it kind of ends it with this idea of, so since a plant has this goal of trying to propagate, try, trying to spread seeds as far as possible and grow more, the, yeah, you could really think of these staple crops as the most successful plants of all time because they've they've tricked, tricked us humans, tricked into, humans into being like, why don't you plant millions of acres of me all over the world? Yeah, and that, yeah. that, that was a really interesting thought because I had not thought of it that way before. I remember that scene. That was a fun one. All right. Fact number three, bats are blind. Oh, boy. I don't think they're actually fully blind. I mean, I think they've got eyes. I just think that... Because they're out at night, they don't use their eyes for navigation. Bats are not blind. You correct. Good oh, job. Yes. So there is no such thing as a blind bat. This is kind of cool. A lot of bats do navigate by echolocation, but they can also see. Even if some of them can't see as well as we do, they still they still have sight. But the bats in the mega bat family, fruit bats, they actually don't use echolocation at all. They navigate purely by sight, and they have outstanding night vision because they fly like at dusk. And mm. yeah, kind of cool, huh? Yeah, I think it's always interesting to watch a bat fly because it just looks like they're floundering around in the air. Like, <laughs> I'm falling. I'm oh, I didn't quite fall there. I'm still falling, and the, and somehow they have got a lot of control. They just don't look like it. No, they they do look. They're pretty pretty fun to watch. I love bats. They're really cool animals. All right, last fact. You ready? Ready. The first potatoes were cultivated in Peru almost seven thousand years ago. Ah, <laughs> oh, boy. I mean, it's, it's specific. I, I don't know my potato lore. I am from Idaho, so Idaho potatoes. You're, maybe, you're from maybe, Idaho. Maybe I, maybe I should you know should know potatoes. potatoes. Uh, you know, it, it sounds plausible. I don't see why it wouldn't be. Again, the, the chat seems to think it's true, so it's it true. It is true. It is true. Potatoes have been around for a very long time. And cool fact, when Europeans first came to the Americas and they said, oh, these people are eating potatoes and tomatoes. Those were two crops from the Americas. They brought them back to Europe, and everyone was really alarmed that they would be eating these things because they recognized that this plant is in the Solanaceae family, and the or the nightshade family, that's a common word for it. And that family is full of really poisonous plants. Tomatoes and potatoes are sure the two exceptions that are not poisonous, but most other members of that plant family, you would not want to eat at all. They're very poisonous. Just, are you telling me potatoes and tomatoes are related plants, actually? Yes, and did you know that you can even get a tomato-potato hybrid that will grow potatoes in the roots and tomatoes on top at the same time. It's not as productive as just a pure tomato plant or a pure potato plant because it's like sending energy to both roots and fruit production. Yeah, if, at you the same time. if you told me that, I would have said false. That really, oh, that, I should have used that, that one. That was a good one. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, oh, yeah. so potatoes are they fruits or vegetables? Tubers. Oh gosh. They're tubers. All right. And tomatoes? They're botanically a fruit, but we use them as a vegetable. That's like a cop out. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to come over here. That's our factor fiction. And now we have a math game. But while Math Thad is um, explaining our math game, I'm going to go grab our egg because I forgot to pull it out of the fridge earlier. And I want to show you how our egg is doing that we started yesterday. And I'm curious how your eggs are doing if you are doing this experiment with us. Okay. Uh, th this game was actually just from my daughter. I think she, she plays it at school. They've got a bunch of little popsicle sticks here, and each of them has a little math problem on it. And they actually put the math problem on both sides. So the way it's played is reach in, pull out the popsicle stick, and you show it to both players, and the first player who can give the correct answer 
gets to keep the popsicle stick. And so they accumulate popsicle sticks until they pull out the popsicle stick that says kaboom. And the kaboom stick resets the game. Put them back in. Well, just the no. person who pulls it out has to put all their popsicle sticks in. Oh! And yeah. then you keep playing. And once you've pulled out a kaboom, then that's kind of like diffusing a bomb. You just put it to the side. And then at the end, whoever has the most wins. So okay. should we we should play a little round. Here's a kaboom stick, because I forgot to add them earlier. Oh. And here's another kaboom stick. Yeah. And we'll play until we get a kaboom, and we'll see which one of us wins. OK, OK, this, this is good. All right, in the chat, everyone wish me luck, because I'm going up against a PhD in mathematics. <laughs> and I don't practice my multiplication tables all that often. All right. So we'll see how we do. All right, and I can't even see it. Four times five is 20. Good. So if I say it first, I get it. All right. 20. Two times 10 is 20. You got it. All right. Kaboom. Oh, man. <laughs> so I win with one stick. Yeah. Go science, mom. Man. <laughs> That's rough. Anyway, um, if, you, if you want to make your own popsicle sticks and play Kaboom, this is a great way to improve your math skills. And you can do multiplication or you can do addition or subtraction facts, whatever you want to do. But the faster and the easier those are with you, it's kind of like learning how to read. The better you are at reading, the more you enjoy reading books. And the better you are at just simple arithmetic, the more enjoyable math will be for you. That's true. And I've got to say, you don't have to be the fastest in the world. I, I think I like games. I think the element of competition can sometimes make things more fun. So what you want is to be proficient and be able to come up with the answers without having to expend a lot of energy. But ultimately, it doesn't matter if you're the fastest one. Uh, Science Mom and I are just competitive, so we like that type of thing. We, we think it's fun, but, but, but he's faster. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. All right, here is our egg. I'm going to bring it just a little bit closer, and you guys can see that there are bubbles, and it's been in the fridge, so it's kind of cold. And if I wipe off that condensation, hopefully you can see it a little bit better. There are bubbles all around the egg, and at the top, and this I'm not going to be able to show you very well with our webcam, but at the top, we've got this sort of brownish foam because we had a brown egg in here. And you can tell that a lot of that brown in the pigment of the eggshell is coming off and just floating up on the top. Now, if you are doing this experiment with us, I recommend changing the vinegar now that it's been one day. You wanna carefully pour out all this vinegar and then pour in new vinegar and that will help the reaction to go a little faster and dissolve the eggshell sooner. And then tomorrow we will check on our egg again and see how it's doing. And if you want it to go faster, you can also, instead of putting it in the fridge, you can keep it on the counter. But if you keep it on the counter, I don't want you to eat your egg when we're done. Math Dad and I are going to boil this egg and eat it after it finishes. What? <laughs> he just gave me the funniest oh. face. He was like, really? I have to eat a vinegar-soaked egg? Don't, we, we did it before, a couple years ago, and you said they weren't that bad. You don't have to eat the whole thing. We'll split it. Are you making this up? Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So that that's that's our egg. Math Dad's gonna go back and stick that back in the fridge. And then it is gonna be time for our engineering challenge. So yesterday's engineering challenge was to make a Da Vinci bridge out of pencils and rubber bands, see how much weight it can hold. And you guys definitely did a fantastic job with your Da Vinci bridges. And if you would like to see some of those entries, if you go over to Facebook and look under albums, we have an album for Quarantine Week 2, and you can see some of the amazing bridges that were made over there. Today's engineering challenge is almost a little um, artistic, and it is to build a peacock out of just one piece of paper. Okay. So, that, 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 that sounds hard. Build a peacock out of one piece of paper. And excuse the noise while I get our, our laptop set up a little closer so you can see better. There we go. So we have two pieces of scratch paper here. We have scissors and we have tape. If you would like to go the origami route, you totally can. You can do, you can do origami. You can do any type of construction that you want to do. It just needs to be one piece of paper, not two or three or four. And give it your best shot. 
Can you bring it, trying to bring it closer? Yeah. All right. So here's my piece of paper. It's scratch paper that has an old thing that I had printed on the back some time ago. There's math dads. Are you ready? I'm ready. You're ready. Let's go. And if you have suggestions for songs that Math Dad should sing that he knows the words to, you can put them in the chat because I, Math Dad has a nice singing voice. I, I actually do, do know the words to a song. It goes like this. I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. Not that song, a different song. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. What does a peacock look like? <laughs> <laughs> this is why I picked this challenge. I knew that I knew that you would have this reaction. And it's got big feathers, but let's see. It looks kind of like a turkey bird. I don't know. It's, it's going to have... I had neighbors when I was growing up who had peacocks, and they actually, they make a really cool, um, they have a really cool sound that they make. They're call. I, I'm not doing a good job imitating it, but if you have never heard a peacock, I, I recommend looking looking up the, the sound they make. And I always felt very lucky when I saw them displayed because peacocks don't walk around with their feathers all fanned out all the time. A lot of times they're walking around with their tail sort of collapsed behind them and the males only display and put out their feathers when they're trying to impress a female. And anytime that I was over by their yard and I saw a peacock display, I was super excited. So it was kind of a rare thing. Oh. So you know how I said I needed to practice art more? I think there's a, the, a flaw in my plan is that if you practice doing art poorly, you're going to get worse, right? Is that <laughs> um, you know, there could be something to that. Hmm. So practice better? Is that what you're... Well, yeah. I, I'm just saying maybe these drawing challenges aren't going to improve, your improve art my art skill because yeah, if I sat down with a picture and actually tried to do a good job, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting thing to try because I mean, no art versus some art. Surely I'm learning something, but I don't know. So it occurred to me that we we have some other fun stories that we could tell. Really? Um, I, I think we, we shared every story. Shared all the stories yeah. that we had? No. <laughs> nah. So I'm the second child out of six in my family. And i got to say, being second was best of all. So my older brother, a couple of years older than me, would get some new privilege. I could get to stay up a little bit later. And I would often get lumped in with, with him and get the advantage. And yeah, we, we wouldn't get lumped in with the younger kids. So I, I, I liked that a lot. Or my older brother was the guinea pig, and then my parents figured out how, how <laughs> the, things would work. The oldest is totally the guinea pig. So I was the I was the oldest. Um, and yeah, that that story that I told you about how when it was time to go to college, my dad was like, "All right, if you don't earn half the money that it takes in three months, you're not going." Really, he just wanted me to, to know how to work. Um, and I'm so happy that that happened to me because I really, yeah, it was a great learning experience. But I took it seriously and was really terrified that if I didn't buckle up, I wouldn't be going to college. Said the same thing to my brother and my sister. Did they get full-time jobs and work two jobs all summer before they went to college? Nope. Did they still go? Did my parents still help them? Yep. So, <laughs> yeah, being the oldest, you are kind of the guinea pig. So, so in your job, you worked on the trail crew. What does a trail crew actually do? They hike every single day, almost all, almost every single day, and they take care of the trails. So if you, especially because some of our trails were used for um, people who <coughs> range land. So in where, where we grew up out west, there is a lot of BLM land, Bureau of Land Management land, and Forest Service land where people graze cattle. So they take their cattle out each spring, 
they let them graze all all year or all summer and then they they come down when when the season is done and those to check on their cattle and check on the fences that would like pin in the cattle there are trails that go there and if the trail is all washed out especially if it's like on a narrow slope and you get there with the horse if you can't turn the horse around trying to get a horse to go backwards is really difficult and that can be like a real real safety issue so Part of it was like just safety for those, you know, the people who are checking on their cattle. And then of course, people like to hike too, just to get out in nature and enjoy nature. So maintaining the trails so that people could enjoy them, that was, that was our job. And it was a fabulous job, favorite job ever. To go hiking all day, to kind of yeah. pack food? Or? Yeah, so we'd have a backpack that would be full of food and you know, you'd, you'd pack your lunch and then you would have, um, tools that we would carry. So chainsaw, um, axes, depending on what trail we were on, shovels, um, Pulaski. The Pulaski is a tool that is sort of unique to like firefighting and forest service work. It has a, a like a, a hoe on one side and it has an ax on the other so that if you're like digging through the dirt and then you get to a big root, you can just turn it around and like chop the root out and then keep digging. That's a cool, cool tool. Sounds like a lot of work. It was it was a fantastic summer job. I loved that job. My my bird over here is starting to look pretty amazing, Jen. My Are you my bird nervous? Not at all. My bird <laughs> is looking even more amazing. Yeah, we'll we'll see what the people in chat think. <laughs> the, they'll be the true judges of our masterpieces. <laughs> they will. They will. Um I'm gonna cut this so I can put it like around a little. You're cutting it, huh? Trying to raise the bar. Are you using scissors too, or are you just like drawing them? You didn't give me scissors. So oh. It's a setup. Here you go. Oh, oh, we now, oh, now she's sharing. Yeah. Um, I, I thought you had a pair over there. Oh no. My apologies. Was it my job to get the scissors? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Liza is science mom Liza is sending me um, little messages about what's happening in the chat and she says that we're getting requests requests for into the unknown old town road baby shark despacito <laughs> do you even know despacito do you know uh, that song? I might recognize it I, I don't though <laughs> so lots of requests coming in so Okay, <clears throat> I'm terrible at song lyrics. Often I'll know the tune, but I won't know the lyrics. So in the barn on the farm, I would listen to the oldie station, and the cows will actually give more milk if there's music playing. It just helps them to relax. They let, they let their milk down better. So we'd have the oldie station on. But it was this old barn, with terrible. So the barn was loud. The radio was old, had awful reception. And so I'd, I'd hear all these oldies tunes, and I would get the lyrics wrong. Or I just, just didn't have any clue what the actual lyrics were. And my brother made fun of me when I sing the wrong words to a song. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it, it trained me very well to pay attention to lyrics. I just, just kind of ignore them. That, that's my excuse. <laughs> that's a pretty good excuse. So if, <clears throat> if we had more time, I would definitely give more a detail and attention to coloring, but I, I like the way my bird's turning out so far, and I think I'm about ready. Are you about ready, Matt? Yeah, I'm just about done. Gobble, gobble. What, 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 what does a peacock say? What does a peacock say? They're, they like, <laughs> like they, they do this weird kind of call sound, and they like kind of cluck sound. I don't know. I was expecting a, a turkey gobble or something. No, not a turkey gobble. All right, so here is my peacock. I fanned the edges and then kind of cut it out so that it would make the tail. And then I've got the, um, yeah, the little body there. There's my peacock. Are you impressed? Uh, yeah, but I, we, no, that's not bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course, the, the important part of a peacock is that it has colors. And <laughs> unfortunately there, science mom. Uh, I've got you beat. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. 
I, I like the colors very much. Good yep. job, Math Dad. All right, so let us know in the <laughs> chat who whose peacock was superior. Yep. The 3D peacock <laughs> that stands all by itself. Woo! Or the colorful peacock. <laughs> Those are your choices. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> We, we hope you enjoyed this simple engineering challenge. And as always, there is, a, there is a prompt on Facebook where you can share your art or you can post it on Instagram and tag us at the Science Mom or use the hashtag Science Mom Squad so that we can see the incredible artwork that you come up with. Ooh. And then last but not least for our first hour here, we have a really cool little math puzzle. This one, this one kind of, this one kind of blew my mind actually when math dad showed it to me last night and told me he could like predict the answer each time. I was like, wait, what, 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 how are you doing that? So we, but, have, we want to turn around. Oh, we want to turn around Facebook. Board. Yeah. But the answer is, yeah, it's a really cool, cool effect. Are you going to, are you going to show them how it works first with the dice? Yeah, we're, we're, but we're, we're, we're going to do this. Okay. So okay. science, so, but we didn't look and see who won in the chat. Oh, we didn't. You're right. Um, all right, I'm seeing math dad one because of color. <laughs> math dad one because of color. Oh, math, math dad has the best. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> science mom, math dad, right, science I, mom, I, science I oh, okay. You know what? I think they feel sorry for you. I think they're all voting for you out of pity. <laughs> out of pity, huh? All right. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. All right, so we have we have two dice here. Okay, so science mom's gonna roll these dice. I'm gonna roll them. And then stack them on top of each other. Stack them on all top. All right, so now that they're stacked, there are. So if we set this down, there would be three hidden faces, and so we we can't see the one on the bottom, and you gotta move your hand because one on the bottom, and then these two right here. Okay, so I'm gonna t just make the prediction that the sum of those three hidden faces, if you add them up, you get ten. So let's see if he's right. So here mm -hmm. is five on the bottom. That's our one on the bottom. Okay. And then we have two, and then this hidden one is three. And three. Three plus two plus five is indeed ten. All right, let's try it again. Because Math Dad showed me yesterday, not only could he do this with the dice, no matter how I rolled them, but he could do it with any number of dice. So we did stacks of like five dice and six dice, and he still could be All right each right, So time. these ones are going to add up to be 11 if we add up the three hidden sides. It's going to add up to be 11. So let's look at our first one. The first one is six. Okay. That's the one that's hidden on the bottom. Now the one that's hidden here, one. Now this one that's hidden, four. Does four that... plus one plus six is <gasps> 11. Oh, should we do one more? Yeah. One more. Say, do a little like mind blown emoji in the chat if you're like, what in the world? How is Math Dad doing this? All right, I'm just going to toss this one and then toss this one, stack them together. All okay. right, 13. 13. So underneath the red one, we have a six. This one that we can't see that's hidden here, blue, is three. And then at the very bottom, a four. Four plus three plus six is thirteen. Whoa! How are you doing this, Math Dad? That, that, that's a good question. Actually, let, let's let's try to make this even more complicated. We don't have any other big dice, but I've got say three smaller dice. I'm gonna ask Science Mom All right. to roll them and stack them. I'm gonna roll them. I'm gonna stack them with my eyes closed, and then as soon as I do. All right, it's gonna add up to be seventeen. Math Dad says 17. I'll try so and hold this close five, so you can see. There'll be five hidden faces, the bottom face, and then four okay. that are in between. The bottom face is one. Okay. And then we have these two faces that are hidden, six and a three. Six and a three. And then these two that are hidden, three and a four. Okay. Three and a four. So four plus three plus three plus six plus one is 17. Yeah. Crazy, right? Last, last night when we were talking about this, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I kept trying to figure it out, and I couldn't figure it out. But then when he told me how it worked, it's actually really pretty easy and pretty cool. That's right. So that's actually going to be a challenge I'm going to leave to you guys today. And I'm going to reveal the answer next time. So the, the hint I'm going to give you, though, is all that I have to do is look at the very top number. And if I know what the very top number is, I can give the answer to this question. So maybe... And you, as you try to analyze this, simplify it. Can you do it with just one die? Then can you do it with two dice? Can you do it with three dice? And it turns out I can do this trick with any number of dice, and I can always get the right prediction just by looking at the top 
number. So that, that's my hint for you, and I, I hope you'll play around with it and see if you can discover what my secret is. Awesome. All right, give it up for Math Dad, and I hope you guys enjoyed that quick little, um, I just lost Demo. the words. Quick, quick little, yeah, kind of like magic trick. A magic trick, trick yeah. A little magic trick. And now we are going to move on to, so we had our math puzzle, now we're gonna move on to our second portion, and we're gonna have another art showcase, and then we're gonna do what's in the bag, and go deeper into the science. So I'm gonna share my screen with you, and then we are going to open up our slideshow here and play. This one, unfortunately, looks like it's still, it's still yeah, blurry. It didn't yeah, load I don't, right. okay. didn't load right. So then this is the first time that Math Dad and I are seeing these because Math um, Science Mom Krista <laughs> pulled these out. Oh, look, Math Dad <laughs> with hair. <laughs> That's fantastic. No, I'm blonde. Oh, I love it. They drew viruses. And thank you, doctors and nurses, for protecting us at this time. That is fantastic. And I see the layer, like doctors and nurses there. Yeah, yeah. Well, great, I, I've great got to say that I, I echo this sentiment. Um, th there are a lot of people who are out there working really hard while yeah. most of us are in quarantine. And yeah, they're, they're doing their job. They're doing them well. And they're, they're keeping us running. So yeah, great really job. It. Great job on that card, Lily. Oh, Claire, this card's fantastic. Look, we've got math and creating, reading and writing. So they just sort of did it like a diagram of all these different activities. I love it. And then Graham did a fantastic <laughs> card here with, it looks like person under, and there's puddles down below. I love it. My little brother Nico is under the umbrella because it's raining cats and dogs. And it's <laughs> literally raining cats and dogs. That's fantastic. Yep. Aw, and a family yeah. underneath an umbrella with a really energetic rainstorm coming down. Lightning, yeah. Chloe drew hot dogs <laughs> raining. I love it. And then we got, this looks like cloudy with a chance of meatballs. I'm looking yeah, yeah. like a spaghetti rainstorm hamburgers, here and hamburgers, yeah. raining spaghetti and meatballs. They're making me hungry. These are fantastic cards, you guys. Oh, it's raining cats. Great job, Natalie. I love this one. Oh, <laughs> that elephant and cat are just the cutest ever. Whoa, look at that. Look at the trunk wraps around. Yeah. Like, how did you learn to draw like that? Oh, that's fantastic. I love this card. Uh oh, I've got another one that didn't load. Sorry. Ooh, I've got a, a monkey. Tree umbrella. That's a fantastic card. Good job, Aiden. <laughs> oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> Great job. I love right. this one. Job, Grayson. Grayson, good job. If all the raindrops were lollipops and gumdrops, oh, what a rain that would be. That would be an incredible rainstorm. Yeah. Oh, and I love the detail on this one with the walking the pet and the rainbow. Beautiful. Cat's dream. <laughs> I love this. Oh, thanks for sending this one in. This one is so cute. I love it. In a crazy world with only weird things, one day it was raining stars. In the morning, how would you react if it was raining stars? It all depends on if they were literal stars or like legitimate or like figurative stars. Figurative mm. stars would be beautiful. Literal stars like flaming balls of gas heavier than the planet would be terrifying. Yeah, yeah. Like, like that Pixar short. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that was. That's one of my favorite Pixar shorts. And I love, I love this rainbow and the way that they did it sideways. It looks beautiful. Rainbow umbrella. And a dragon. Great job, Mia. This one's, this one's really fun. And is that a llama with wings? <laughs> it's fabulous. And then Kyle, fat, fantastic job. I love this. Holding up the heavy rain. Oh, these are so fun, you guys. I hope you enjoyed making these cards as much as we enjoyed seeing your art because this art is just fantastic. Let me in. Nope, you're out of luck. <laughs> Good thing you have an umbrella. Damn. Snails and whales. That's a fantastic one. Raining cats and dogs. And the bunny's like, no, I don't want to get eaten. I love it. <laughs> oh, singing a song and I don't know the words. I'm telling you, this is becoming a cult favorite. And I think people all over the world are like, can't get it out of their heads now. <laughs> <laughs> Raining pizza. Oh, you guys are really making Math Dad hungry now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you again for sharing your artwork with us. We loved seeing these submissions. And I want to give a shout out and a thanks to Science Mom Krista for 
um, gathering those for us. And again, if you want to share your artwork, you can put it on Instagram with hashtag Science Mom Squad or on Facebook. We have an album called Quarantine Week 2 and every single drawing prompt and engineering challenge for the whole week is there. And you can just put them underneath the corresponding picture. Now, are you guys ready for what's in the bag? I'm ready because today's the day. Today's the day? Yeah, I didn't, didn't get the riddles earlier, but I'm, I'm getting the what's in the bag. All right, we'll find out. We'll find <clears throat> out if you get it. All right. I have cities, but no houses. I have <sighs> mountains, but no trees. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> I have water, but no fish. <sighs> cities, but no houses. Mountains, but no trees. And then water, but no... Someone said the board game Catan, and that is close. Uh, wait, it's a board game? No, it's not is a board it? game, but that's oh, like in the map. Yes. And without the chat, he would have been doomed, you guys. You, you <laughs> saved his bacon. I would have been here all day. <laughs> Good all right. job. Yeah, because a map will have cities, but no actual houses. Well, it depends on the map. I guess some maps could have a house drawn on them. Have mountains, but no trees, because usually they just draw like a little mountain ridge, no trees, and water, but no fish. So uh, I'd say that's, that's a really good puzzle. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's true of most maps. Although it all depends. All depends on what you draw on your map. Oh, well, I'm impressed with whoever's coming up with these. I, I don't think I've gotten one right yet. Have I? <laughs> Shout out to science mom Emily. She's been the one gathering a lot of those. Emily. All right. For our science lesson, we are going to go just a little bit deeper into enzymes and talk about those just a little bit more because enzymes are really awesome. And before, when we were talking about um, the elephant toothpaste reaction, we gave sort of like a real quick overview, but let's go into it just a little bit deeper. So I'm gonna grab a marker here. So you guys know that the reaction that we had with elephant toothpaste is hydrogen peroxide breaking down. So we call this decomposition. If you have one thing and then it breaks apart into two things, that's a decomposition and it breaks down into water and oxygen. And again, oxygen is usually O2. I'm not balancing this equation because we're just kind of keeping things simple and that's okay. So it's breaking down and this will happen on its own, but it happens really, really slowly. And the way we speed it up is by using an enzyme called catalase. Catalase. I hope I spelled that right. Nothing like trying to write something out on like a live stream to test your spelling skills. Here's my phone math, Dad. You can double check me. Now, here's the cool thing about oxygen. We need oxygen to breathe, but oxygen is also potentially dangerous because oxygen doesn't always stay nice and happy in this O2 form. Sometimes you have a molecule of oxygen. Sometimes it will split in two and you will have what's called a free radical. You will have a lone oxygen that is just going around your cell and it can do a lot of damage to your DNA. So we like oxygen, we need oxygen to breathe, but a single oxygen, we call this a radical, a free radical. A single oxygen that's a free radical is actually a really dangerous thing. For our cells, that can cause a lot of damage to our DNA. It causes, it helps contribute to aging. You know, your skin losing elasticity as you get older. There's a lot of damage that can do. And one of the biggest things that we worry about is free radicals damaging our DNA and causing cancer. And that's why things like antioxidants, so like vitamin C, things that, that will take these free radicals and kind of gobble them up and get rid of them are, are good for us. And that's also why every single one of your cells has this enzyme catalase. And that's the enzyme that was in the yeast. Now here's the cool thing about enzymes. Enzymes work by making a reaction easier and they are so fast. One catalase enzyme can cause millions of hydrogen peroxide molecules to break apart within seconds. Like it's, it's just incredible how fast they are. And one of the questions that I remember having when I was a kid and I first heard about enzymes, I was like, well, why? Why do they work? And if you're wondering why they work, I'm about to explain, about to tell you. It helps to think of things in terms of energy. 
So why would why does this break down in the first place? And it's because hydrogen peroxide it exists at what kind of like a higher energy level. And things that are at higher energy, just like water always wants to flow downhill, things that are at high energy, they would rather be at a low energy level if they could. But there, it doesn't just spontaneously break down because there's like a little bit of a hill that it has to get over. It needs a little bit of an input, a little bit of energy in. And the same, think about this the same way with a candle. So if I'm holding a candle, I grabbed one earlier that I was gonna use as a visual aid, but it's missing. It's all right, just imagine, I'm holding a candle. You know that this candle can light on fire and burn. The wax in the candle can turn into carbon dioxide, but it doesn't just happen on its own. You need to add heat. And once you add heat and add the fire, then the candle will, that reaction will continue and it will burn and burn and burn. But the reason why it doesn't happen on its own right away is because of that little hill of energy, which is called activation energy. So here is our, H2O2 right here. Here's water and oxygen down here. It would like to go here, but there's a little bit of a hump. And if it just waits long enough, it will kind of fall over on its own. But what an enzyme does is lower that hump. It takes it and makes it more of a smooth path so that then it can just go whoo and fall down really easily. And most enzymes are proteins. Most catalysts are proteins. And the way that they work is actually just by holding the molecule in the exact right position so that then it's like, aha, now it can happen. So I'll answer just a few quick questions about that, but that is our, what, that is kind of our. What, what, is, what is a protein? What is a protein? Proteins are awesome. Proteins are strands. Oh boy, this is like a whole nother lesson. Oh, well maybe, we'll maybe, maybe we don't need to get into it if it's too much. Proteins are basically just long strands of something called amino acids. So just like if you put beads on a necklace, then you make a long necklace. If you put amino acids together, you make a protein. And I'm going to, I'm going to let Math Dad take just a few of your questions. Well, real quick, I'm going to set up a slight variation on our elephant toothpaste that we're going to try. So Math Dad, you'll take just a couple questions while I set this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So what is my favorite state of matter? Do I have a favorite state of matter? I mean... I'm I'm very fond of <laughs> gases because I like to breathe. So I'm um, solids. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know how you, how you can really pick one, but um, I don't know. I think gases have some nice properties, it's compressibility. You can do some neat experience experiments. So I'll, I would say gases. All right. Ooh. So the question was, what is tomorrow's drawing prompt? So we managed to forget to mention it in the past. So. Tomorrow's drawing prompt is to design, design a, a, a roller, roller coaster. coaster. So, so. I, I, don't, I didn't upload a picture of it, but it is on the little handout. Design a roller coaster. It can be as calm or as wild as you want, and it can be in any setting that you want. That's right. So have fun with make it. Make 2D, you can make it 3D, you can make this any way you want. A, a drawing. We're doing a we're, drawing. The, we're going to build roller coasters the next day. But okay, so, so yeah. Today is a drawing. Focus on the drawing. That's, that's, that's a good idea. There, there will be an opportunity to, to make one in the future. Okay, so uh, yeah, make, make sure you design your roller coaster and you can post it there on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you, Science Mom Eliza, for pointing that out. All right. Yeah, so you. I said, what's a protein? And he said, well, it's a chain of amino acids. And now they're like, well, what's an amino acid? So, yeah. I'll, I'll show you in just a minute. I, I think we've got <laughs> some, some, some tricky questions here. All right. So, lots of requests for the duck song, whatever that is. But <laughs> is, is, um, that, is that that one about like the duck and the grapes and the lemonade? It may be. I, my, my kids have played a duck song. Um, are we going on Desmos? I, I didn't set up an activity. I... So I don't, I don't have a code for us today. Um, if you like the Desmos activities, if that's something you enjoyed, let me know because I, I can certainly set things up. I've got plenty of activities and problems to, to draw from. All right, ooh, I'm getting a request for the secret fourth verse of the Baby Shark song. I think it goes like this. <laughs> I'm singing a song, I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long. But I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. So somebody actually sent a video. of so the 13-year-old had made up 
their own piano version of this with chords and it comes yeah it was, it was amazing pr- pr- pretty impressive but I, I think you just made that up i don't think anyone was requesting the secret verse of baby shark well oh no the, the chat was just filled with it <laughs> from top to bottom nothing but requests for that song all right so math dad just for fun we're going to do a little variation on our elephant toothpaste okay. i will i will give you the handy yellow bucket in case of spills oh so i mentioned earlier that if you don't have soap you'll still see some bubbles coming up. And I thought it would be fun if we actually demonstrated this. So I'm gonna have Math Dad be my brave volunteer and hold hold this right here so they can, hopefully they can see inside here. We'll turn it like that so that they have a good view of the inside. Excuse me. And keep that down there. All right. We're going, so we have food coloring and hydrogen peroxide in here, but we have no soap. So if you were all out of soap and didn't have any soap at home, could you still do this reaction? Would it still work? We're about to find out. You ready, Math Dad? I guess I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> last time my hand smelled like vinegar when we were done. What am, what's it gonna smell like today? So we're adding our yeast. This yeast is um, a little older and I don't think it'll be quite as quite as active as our other yeast. And then since we don't have soap, my prediction is that we are not going to actually get to the top of the bottle. So Math Dad is just fine uh-huh. holding this just how he is because it's not going to make it up there. Wait, so so what did you put in this? It was different? You just didn't? No soap. So it's it's the exact same? Exact same. No thing, soap. Just with no soap. And um, older yeast. I had two packets of yeast. One of them has already been opened and has been sitting open for a while. The other one that we used before, this was new yeast. The new, new yeast was very active and came up a lot faster. Our old yeast is not quite as active. So it's coming up a bit slower, but if you turn it sideways this way with the green, you can sort of see those bubbles a little bit better. Maybe, I don't know, that reflection is so bright. If I stand there and try and block the light, (laughs) you can see that our bubbles are a lot larger, but we still get bubbles because yeast has a chemical in it that is similar to soap. And so we still are getting some bubbles, but they're a lot larger and there are not as many of them and it's not capturing the gas right quite as well. And I don't think it's going to make it out of the top, although Start, I think Math Dad's getting nervous. Starting to get closer. <laughs> <laughs> it is getting closer. All right. So, so what is hydrogen peroxide usually used for? Just cleaning cuts? Is that is that why people A use, lot of right? people use it to clean cuts, although, and I think like there's a nice mental aspect to pouring it on and there's a slight little sting and you see the bubbling. And if you think like, ah, oh, it's killing all the germs, maybe that makes you feel better. But in reality, it's actually not a very strong disinfectant. And so pouring on a cut doesn't really do much. Although if you do have a cut, rinse it, cleaning the cut off is a really good idea. So if you're pouring hydrogen peroxide into it, onto it, that's similar to rinsing it off with water. But if you're getting rid of dirt and things from the cut, that's always beneficial. All right, I think the bubbles are popping. I think it's going back They down. are, they are. So Math Dad is safe. Aren't you, see, you, you should have trusted me. I saw you looking all nervous and I was like, don't worry, I got you, I got your back, Math Dad. Yeah, you've I'm never, not gonna get you messy. you'd never make a mess, no. <laughs> We will take a couple more a couple more questions about about this this aspect with chemical reactions. So if you have chemical reactions, we'll take a couple more questions before we oh, someone said Pop Tart Toaster said to tickle math dad. I'm not gonna tickle math dad. That's a bad idea. <laughs> All right. So real quick recap. So today we learned about chemical reactions, specifically hydrogen peroxide breaking down into water and oxygen. And this reaction happens faster if you have a catalyst. In our bodies, most of our catalysts are enzymes. Enzymes are proteins, and we'll be learning more about proteins um, in in a couple weeks. We'll be learning more about proteins the week after next week. Next week is physics, and then the week after that, we're doing biology and genetics, and we'll talk a lot more about proteins then. But I hope you enjoy some fun. If you have hydrogen peroxide at home, this reaction is a lot of fun to do. And if you don't have hydrogen peroxide at home, I know it can be kind of hard to find right now. Um, There are some great video demonstrations you can see of this reaction happening. And then hopefully you can bookmark it for later. And then, you know, in a few months from now, when hydrogen peroxide becomes more readily available, hopefully you can find someone to do it because it's a really fun demonstration. Anything else we should add about elephant toothpaste before we go on? Um... No, just uh, use more food coloring than use you'd more expect. F- if, yes. if, if you want a lot of colors, you actually have to use a lot of food coloring just because the bubbles are so light. Yeah, the bubbles really are quite white. And so if you want to have really colorful foam coming out, you're going to want to add like 20 drops of food coloring 
Otherwise, your foam will look almost white. If you add one or two drops of food coloring, it'll be almost white. All right, now we have, so we're in our, our second hour. We had our science lesson and jokes. We have three jokes. We have three jokes, and then it is time for Math Dad. And I will say, yesterday, Math Dad's lesson was like, whoa. We went into geometric series and all sorts of cool stuff, and he's going to touch on that a little bit of, again, but I know that for quite a few kids, they were saying in the chat, like, you lost me. It was too much. But don't worry. We've got some, we've got some really cool math coming up, and Math Dad he does a good job of explaining things. And if it is a little bit too far above your head, sometimes it helps to really, it really helps to hear an idea one time, and then when you hear it the second and the third time, it'll stick. You ready for some okay. jokes, Matt, Dad? All right, I'm, I'm ready. Okay. Okay. What room doesn't have doors? Oh, boy. What room does not have doors? It would be a window room, a closed room. I don't, I don't know. What room doesn't have doors? A mushroom. <laughs> that is true. Mushrooms do not have doors. Mushrooms do not have doors. You ready for the next one? I'm ready. Why can't Cinderella play soccer? Okay, why can't Cinderella play soccer? So something about getting to the ball. So she can't get to the ball. She has a pumpkin carriage. I, I, because I, she's always running away from the ball. She's running away from the ball. There you yeah, go. you were in the right. You were heading in the right direction. Good job. <laughs> and then last joke. What do you call a bear with no teeth? A bear. With no teeth, toothless bear, uh, no fanged bear, I don't know. A gummy bear. A gummy bear, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really sad, a big bear with no teeth. With, with no actual just teeth. trying to gum everything. That, <laughs> that would be sad, that would be sad. So if you have if you have jokes you would like to submit, feel free to send them to us. We, we have had a couple great submissions already. And now we will, I'll turn it over to Math Dad for our math lesson. All right. So last time, we actually ran out of time, and I, I didn't get to uh, mention a game that I, I wanted to bring to your attention. So tic-tac-toe we had talked about, and my guess is that every one of us has played tic-tac-toe before. But what about reverse tic-tac-toe? I'm just going to write out reverse tic-tac-toe. So what do I mean by reverse tic-tac-toe? Well, the first player to get three in a row loses. So you don't want to get three in a row. And so everything you know about tic-tac-toe is suddenly not true anymore and for this particular game. Usually with tic-tac-toe, you want to be the player who goes first. Now you don't want to go first because that gives you an opportunity for more symbols. So. Yeah, if I can get Science Mom to come up here, we'll actually even just try playing a game and, and, and see how this goes. All right, do you want to go first or second? Um, I will go. I will go first. Okay. So she goes here. I go next to her. Now remember, we're playing reverse tic tac toe. Oh no! <laughs> All right. <laughs> were you not listening? I, I, I think she wasn't listening. Sci sci Science <laughs> Mom, why is it? it sent me questions people had in the chat, and I was looking at those questions. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll see how she does. So you remember, you're trying to not get three in a row. Yeah, I'm doomed. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And here's the here's the moment of truth. No matter where Math Dad goes, I lose because. Aha. Uh -huh. There's three yeah, in a row. Three X's there, or three X's there. She lost, lost it's it a in double two loss. directions. Yeah, okay, so this is a... Can we can we do another game? Oh, Real yeah, we, we can try another game. Sure, All sure. All right, now, now that I'm like not trying to get three in a row, now that, I'm, now that I know the rules, I'll do a little better. <laughs> All right. Do so you want to go first still? You go first. Okay, I, I, I will go first. All right, I'm not going to... Just go. Okay, <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pick a place and I'm gonna go there. So I'm X. All right, and I'm gonna be O. Oh man, I can't remember. We even made this cute little folding book about strategy, and I can't remember what the trick is. Doing pretty well. I'm just trying to reason my way through this. <laughs> oh, now I'm in trouble. Now I'm in trouble. Yes. Ah. Uh, 
Snap, so science mom wins that one. Okay, so my question for you guys, and it's something that can only be discovered through a lot of uh, play and analysis, is so that when you start a game, there are three options. You can pick either a corner, an edge, or the center. And one of those three options is the best option for this game. In fact, two out of those three options will lose will cause you to lose if your opponent plays the, the best possible moves. So there's only one good first move. Either it's a corner square or it's a side or an edge or it's the center. And my challenge for you guys is can you figure out which of those options is the best option? How does one not lose this game? So because it's it's hard to avoid getting three in a row when your opponent okay, plays fewer times than you do and yeah, when, when they're just also trying to avoid it. So the best you can do is to try to get a draw in this game, but what would be the strategy that could lead you there? So that, that's my question for you. All right, I wanted to get back to what we were talking about last time. We were adding up infinite series, and I, I gave us a formula, and I'm not going to make a big deal about the fractions because I, the feedback was that it was get, getting a little complicated for a lot of the audience, but the question I had given us was we had a square, we cut it into four equal pieces, we shaded the top right and the bottom left, and then we repeated the same process on the upper left square, shade the top right, shade the bottom left, Cut it in fourths, shade the top right, shade the bottom left. Cut it in fourths, shade the top right, shade the bottom left. And we just do this forever and ever. And so if we could keep zooming in, we could keep doing this. Okay, suppose the entire square gets shaded in that fashion. What portion overall got shaded? And to answer that, here, here, here's the easy way of doing it. Notice that the entire shape is built up out of L's like this, and each of those L's has two parts out of three that are shaded. So that's an L. Oh, my erasable markers are. But here's an L right here, there's an L here, an L here, an L here. Yeah, lots and lots of L shapes like these. In fact, the entire square is built up of those L shapes, and two-thirds of each of them is shaded. So overall, two-thirds of the entire shape will be shaded. So the, the answer to the riddle was, the question was that two-thirds of this whole square gets shaded. Now, let's see if we can recognize this uh, in terms of the formula that I had written last time. So. Here, well, I shaded these two parts. Altogether, that was a one half. Plus, then I shaded those two next. Well, let's see, that's half of this fourth here. So that's actually a one eighth that got shaded there. And then it'll be one thirty second for the next two, one over 128. And th this is going to go forever and ever. So notice each term is one fourth of the term that came ahead of it. So if we used our formula, we, this should add up to be a over 1 minus r. So a was the first term, 1 half, divided by 1 minus, and then the ratio. So we said each term was 1 fourth of the previous term. All right, so what do we get if we divide 1 half div over what will be 3 fourths? Well, it, it turns out that you'll get exactly two-thirds, which was the answer to the question. So you're going to get two-thirds of the entire square shaded. And so in my Calculus 2 class, I, I make them do this infinite series formula, but some people were clever enough to recognize this L pattern. All right, so we have the dice problem that I wanted just to remind you about. So. Hoping you guys can put in some time, see if you can figure out what is going on here. How am I able to predict 
what the sum will be for the hidden three faces just by looking at the top number. So that, that, that'll keep you busy, but it's, 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 it's kind of a fun challenge to figure out, and I think you guys can do it. Awesome. We had a couple really good questions come in about hydrogen peroxide that I want to answer real quick. And the first one was, what if you don't have H2O2? What if you don't have hydrogen peroxide? What can you substitute in the elephant toothpaste reaction? And there isn't something else that you can put in where you can add yeast and see all the bubbles come up, but you can substitute baking soda and vinegar. So if you have baking soda and vinegar, is that what we did last time with that the exploding is, bag? Yes, baking soda plus vinegar, and you put it inside this same big style of bottle, like what we did here, and you add soap, you will see an almost identical column of bubbles coming up. Of course, it all depends on how much vinegar and baking soda you add, and what I recommend doing is don't try to pour the powder of the baking soda in, because it's hard to pour the powder in quickly enough, and it will start reacting. Take maybe, let's say, let's say one cup, one cup of vinegar, and then take a quarter cup of baking soda and mix it with a quarter cup of water. And once you've made your baking soda solution with a little bit of baking soda mixed with water, then pour it in and it will come up just like our elephant toothpaste does as long as you add soap. Soap is very important to add. If you don't add soap, then you will just kind of see foaming, but it's not gonna come all the way out of the top and it's not gonna make foam. But if you add soap, you will see that foamy reaction. And you add that before the baking soda mixture. Yes, so okay. put your vinegar in, add soap to it, and then add your baking soda mixture. And that is a substitution that you can do if you want to have the same effect as the elephant toothpaste. It will look very similar and you can add food coloring and stripe it however you want. It is gonna go up faster. It's gonna go a lot faster. In fact. If you don't, if you start pouring slowly into the funnel, you will hear air pushing up on the funnel before you've even finished pouring. So you want to hold the funnel up a little higher from the the bottle, pour in really fast. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think, like, do we have Thank enough you. vinegar to try it? Should we should we try this and like kind of compare the two and show them? We we, we could. I don't know if we have enough vinegar. I, we because we have to refresh our egg. Yeah, we used it all last time. Ooh, I think I don't. I think we're out of vinegar. Maybe, maybe next time. Maybe next time. Maybe next time we'll do this one and we can compare the two. So that was one question that we got. Um, another question was, why does hydrogen peroxide bleach things? Because if you, um, some people, I remember my brother when I was a teenager, he um, soaked his hair in hydrogen peroxide to turn it blonde because he wanted to have blonde hair. So people can use hydrogen peroxide to bleach things. Why does that work? And the answer is, it's more complicated than Science Mom has time to explain right now. I started, I started sort of looking it up and trying to research, but the main, the main thing going on is that hydrogen peroxide is very reactive. And when it splits apart and you form these little free oxygens, or when other molecules bump into it, it will break apart. Those oxygens can cause a lot of changes to happen. And one of the changes is that pigments, things that have color, will will change and react with this. So that's kind of a simple explanation. And then one more good hydrogen peroxide um, question that we had is, can you keep hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide? Is there any way to keep it from turning into water and oxygen? And permanently, I would say no. Like if you want, if you had a molecule of hydrogen peroxide and wanted to keep it like that for like, you know, the next thousand years, I don't think, I, I don't know how you could do that. But keeping it in a dark bottle and keeping that bottle sealed, it does have a pretty long shelf life. It will last for quite a while like that. Once you open it up and it's exposed to air and there are oxygen molecules that can kind of help start that reaction happening, then it will break down faster. But a sealed bottle will last for quite a while. So. Interesting. All right. Any other, just check real quick for any other questions about hydrogen peroxide. It looks huh. like we are we are good. So now um, we did our five jokes. Math Dad had a little lesson. I have a couple questions that I pulled from, um, from Facebook and from submissions that people had sent in. So the first one was, what does the 19 mean in the term COVID-19? Are there 18 other 
COVID, you know, coronaviruses that were named one through 18. And it actually does not refer to that. 19 refers to the year that the virus was first discovered, which was 2019. So since December 2019 was when that virus was first identified, the name is COVID-19, referring to the year. How did you learn that? Because uh, Google, you, you, you seem to know a bunch of random stuff. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so you actually just went and looked it up. Yeah, I looked it up. I looked it up because I, I was curious. So yeah, I learned it, learned it from Google. And I think um, the Harvard has this free online learning system called Lab Exchange. And actually, some of my science videos, mom videos, are on Lab Exchange, which I feel really excited and honored um, to be able to participate with them. And they have a really good learning pathway that goes through a lot of details about COVID-19. So I think I might maybe first saw it there. Yep. All right, next question. So that was question number one. Next question, number two. What gas is in a black light? This was a question from yesterday that I thought was a great question. And when I started researching it, it turns out that it's actually somewhat complicated to answer because there are a lot of different styles of black light. So the, the main thing to think about here is that light, light travels like a wave. And some waves have, have low energy, some waves have high energy, and UV light has higher energy than visible light. And so when you're making a light bulb, if you're making a light bulb like a fluorescent light where you want people to see, you kind of you block out that light and you want all of the visible light to go through. But if you're making a black light, you want to block out the visible light and just let the UV light go through. If your black light is a fluorescent light, then it's actually going to have very similar gas in, in, in it as a regular fluorescent light bulb. It'll have mercury gas in it. But the bulb has a special covering around the outside that filters out the visible light and just lets the UV light go through. But there are LED black lights and lots of different types of black lights that kind of work in different ways. It all depends. But the main idea is that you want to make light, which is, you know, excited photons traveling up and down. And you want to just have the high energy photons go through. And you want to have some sort of paint or, you know, barrier around the light that blocks the visible light. That's how black lights work. And then our third question that I got in advance was why does alcohol burn? And if you, if you tried our little activity yesterday with rubbing alcohol, with putting rubbing alcohol on water or with um, separating it and salting out the rubbing alcohol, I should have made a note to be careful with rubbing alcohol because it is flammable. And the reason why it's flammable is because it has this little chain of carbons. So if those three, those three, those three blue circles are gonna represent our carbons. And then this red circle is gonna represent our oxygens. And I'm not going to draw the hydrogens for now. We need to get a new, new red one. Any time that you have some carbons hooked together, just like we drew before, where you have that, that energy potential, if you have a lot of carbons hooked together, that's kind of high energy. And if you add just a little bit of heat, then those same carbons are like, woohoo, we can turn into carbon dioxide. And when they travel down and turn into carbon dioxide, you produce heat and light and fire. And then if one rubbing alcohol molecule gets you know, ignites and produces some heat, then that can cause other rubbing alcohol molecules to ignite, and you can kind of get a chain reaction. So it's flammable because just like gasoline is a whole bunch of carbons hooked together with, you know, they're bigger molecules, they have more energy that they can release, then they want to go to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is like the simplest, lowest form of carbon. All other forms of carbon would like to be carbon dioxide because it is so simple and its energy level is so much lower. So that's kind of a, a real quick, simple answer as to why, sorry, it's bothering me that you can't see that oxygen molecule I drew. So that's a simple, an simple explanation as to why rubbing alcohol is flammable. All right, let's. All right, actually, I've seen an interesting question in the chat, off topic here, but a, a bit of a tangent, say. Tangent, uh, yeah, right. So the question was, where does that phrase, a bit of a tangent, come from? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, okay. That's a math dad question. All right. And the answer is, I don't know. But what, what? I, what I do <laughs> know is the mathematical use of a tangent. So yeah, if you, yeah, I'm black, it's easier to see. If you have a curve and then you have some line that hits the curve at one point and shares the same slope, we call that line a tangent line. And 
that line is actually a pretty good approximation of the curve as long as we stay near that point. So we can use, lines are actually really easy to compute. Computers are super good at lines, of course. And yeah, often we use the lines to approximate a much more complicated curve solution. And so this tangent line is some, you can think of it as something that's close by, but that's slightly diverging from where you were at. So when we... So it's close to the curve, but not exactly the curve. That, that, that's right. So if we were talking about something and said, ooh, well, here's something related, but not quite the same, we're going on a tangent. So that, that matches up with the, the terminology of this. So then the question was, well, which came first, the, the phrase going on a tangent or the tangent lines? And my guess is it's the mathematical term, but they probably both have some common root, maybe Greek or Latin. And I'm, I'm not even sure that the, the phrase going on a tangent matches up or was derived from the mathematical term. But there, there is a connection there, and I'm glad you, you brought that up. Nice. And then I'm going to ask um, science mom Krista and Liza if you if there's another another question. So we we had four questions. <laughs> Students are always trying to get their teacher to go off on a tangent. This is true. Let's have let's have another question. <laughs> Sing Rainbow by Casey Musgraves. Do you have my phone? We're getting lots of requests. Requests. One of my favorite requests that I saw so far was sing the, um, what does the fox say? Uh, <laughs> I, I have heard that song, I don't, and I don't know the, the words to that we one. We'd that, have to look uh, up the, the lyrics for that. You know, what does the fox say? But yeah, that, that's all I remember. <laughs> <laughs> There's like that fun, like, dee, 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 do, do, yep. do, 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 yep. Boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Ooh, what would happen if you added rubbing alcohol to dry ice? It would be similar to putting dry ice into water, um, but the rubbing alcohol is, it doesn't have as strong of surface tension as water. So I think, and it's also going to go into the air more easily. So I actually think the smell would be pretty overpowering. If you put dry ice into rubbing alcohol, you would cause a lot of it to go up into the air and it would smell, it would be, I don't recommend it. It would smell we, really bad. We would be smelling the rubbing alcohol. It, yes. it would go into gas. Yeah, yeah. It, you, you can smell rubbing alcohol. When you open up a bottle, it has a really distinctive smell because the molecule is small and those little carbons, you know, it can go up to the air. It's volatile. It goes travels into the air easily. So dry ice and rubbing alcohol would be a bad idea. And we're, <laughs> we're getting mostly singing requests in the chat which is cracking me up it's not quite time for singing yet you guys we will do we will do singing soon all right first let's let's take just a few more questions and if we don't have any questions in the chat i actually have a math question for math dad something that i saw another what? parent struggling with on online because when when you and i learned multiplication they really just showed us one way to multiply and so like if let's for, for example let's say there are 24 hours in a day, and we know that we are going to be quarantined for the next um, 15 days. So how many hours are we going to be quarantined? Like there's, there's a multiplication problem for us, right? And the sure. way that we learned how to do it was to set it up like this. Okay, so then you do 4 times 5 is 20. You put the 0 there, carry the 2. 2 times 5 is 10, plus the 2 more, 120. All right, now we add a zero and we do one times four, one times two, we add them up and that would be 360. So if you've, maybe, what is that? Fourth grade probably, where, where you learn this, this trick and you do a lot of problems and you get to the point where you're pretty good at it. But I think, I think the issue is if people don't understand why we put the zero here and why we move things over, then when they see a different way to multiply, like the little, like the box cross multiplication, it just, it's, it's really tricky. So let's, maybe let's look at box multiplication and then let's explain why we do things the way we do with this. Okay. Because I, I saw on Facebook the other day, um, a, a parent had been given one of those box multiplications thing and was just like, help, this is not the way I did math. I don't know what to do. So I thought it would be good if we had math dad explain this. All right, so I'm going to draw a two by two box, and that's because each of those were two digits. We got 24 and 15. All right, and then I'm actually going to draw some diagonal lines. 
through these. All right, and we're gonna do this. So five times four is 20. So I'm gonna put the tens digit here, the ones digit here. Four times one is just uh, four. Put the four there, put a zero there. All right, two times five is 10. So tens digit, ones digit. And then two times one is two. So I'm gonna put a zero and a two. All right, so we're just doing our basic multiplication tables. And now we're going to add down in the diagonal direction. So down in that direction, if we add, we just get zero. Down in this direction, four plus two plus zero is six. Down in this direction, we're going to get a three. And then in that direction, nothing. But 360 was the exact same result we had gotten before. And whoa. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a kind of a mystery, like what in the world is going on there? But this organization is all about bookkeeping. Um, right behind you. Yeah, so now I can always lose the eraser. So you could do that same trick with any size of number. And what you'll discover is you're just doing, we, we had lined up the same numbers. They were just on a diagonal this time as the numbers that we had in the previous problem. The entire calculation was identical. So it's just how we're organizing things. So th then comes the question, all right, why when we're multiplying these, so do this real quick. So five times four was 20, put two there, we carried it. All right, why do we put a zero here before we multiply the one times the 24? So why do we do that? And the answer is, well, this number 15 is really 10 and five. So I'm not multiplying one by 24, I'm really multiplying 10 by 24. But when you multiply by 10, that essentially will just add a zero, move the decimal place over by one. That is why we put the zero here. It's because I'm, I'm not multiplying by one, I'm really multiplying by 10. And the same thing, if there's another digit here, you would put two zeros because you're multiplying by some number of hundreds. Or more, more digits. So I actually don't know the, the fancy name for this grid multiplication. It's box. Box multiplication, multiplication. is what I've seen it called. Okay, yeah. And you know what? I didn't learn it when I was going to school either, but it's it's one of those things. Huh, that's kind of fun. Let's see if, if we play around with it. But if you take the time to do this calculation both ways, you'll see you're doing everything exactly the same. They're just lined up differently because of the, the way we'd organize things. Will you set up one more box multiplication grid and just explain how you set the numbers up? Yes, yes, so okay. let, let's do another. So let's do 123 times, I don't know, 46. So in this case, I need three columns, two rows, and now I'm gonna throw diagonal lines here. All right, maybe I'll make this number even bigger. Let's, I'm making this a, it wasn't a one, it was a nine. All right, so 923 times 46. And then I'm just gonna multiply the digits one at a time. So six times three is 18. Six times two is 12. Six times nine is 54. All right, three times four is 12. Two times four is eight. So I put a zero eight, and then nine times four is 36. Okay, so now I've got several diagonals here. So I'm just gonna draw these arrows. And, all right, so that, that should give us uh, our number. So add down each diagonal. I'm seeing eight, two plus one plus two is five. One plus eight plus one plus four, oh, 14, uh-oh. So I'm going to put the four here, and I'm actually going to carry the one over to here. Zero plus six plus five plus one is 12. Oh, I'm going to put the two here. I'm going to carry the one up here, and three plus one is four. So that's 42,458. So actually, this is good that you had me do another problem because I should show what, what do you, how do you carry something. And well, what you need to do is carry it over to the next diagonal and yeah that's our box multiplication what's your favorite way to multiply if you were going to have a big multiplication problem what's your favorite way to do it well 
it, it all depends. Often I try to do things in my head just to see if I can. Uh, but that, that's probably beyond what uh, you, you, you would want to do. Uh, <laughs> so I, I usually organize it just the, the typical way that I learned. Um, th this way I've got to draw more lines and, and boxes. But uh, I don't know. The, the, some, there's something nice about this particular method because you're able to yeah, keep track. And, and yes, yeah, so, somehow the calculations just seem smaller. And yeah, the, the carrying of the, the digits was, was easier. The, whereas here we had to carry when we added, but that, so that, that nothing new there. But as far as the multiplication went, the, the digits just seemed to play more nicely with each other. All right. Is hydrogen peroxide naturally occurring? Um, it is a byproduct. Like, it, yeah, it will it will occur naturally. Although I'm not sure off the top of my head what reactions would produce it, but it is it is something that exists out in the real world, and that's why cells all have the enzyme catalase to try and kind of scavenge and and break it down. Because if it does show up in your in your cell, that can be bad news. Good question. How long were the hours math dad worked at, at the, the farm? farm? So I can do the math, the $2,000 he earned. <laughs> well, it turns out that particular math is not so uh, That's so difficult because it was- $1 per hour of work, so. Th th that's right, I worked 2,000 hours to earn my $2,000. Now, I mean, I, I, how old was I when I started working seriously on the farm? I um, mean, I was probably, it was like eight, eight nine years old. Probably took a couple of years to get, to get that many hours in, and then, I mean, how, how much help is a is a nine year old, maybe ten year old? I, I, if if his name is Math Dad, he's very helpful, right? Yeah, but but you know, when, when you're a kid, you're not that helpful. I mean, I, I don't think I, I deserved minimum wage for the amount of effort that I put into it, or was really able the, the things I was able to do. But I I, I was helpful, and it definitely did train me because. Before long, the, the tasks but, got bigger and bigger. But probably it was over three or four years that you worked about 2,000 hours, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Probably, yeah, I'm, several I'm gonna, years. I was going to guess two years, but yeah. Yep. Um, I'm seeing ooh, one, one more question, and, and this one's kind of like a, a review. We already answered it, but I'll just say once again. Why does hydrogen peroxide bubble on biological things? It's all because of the enzyme catalase. Every living cell that we that we know of has this enzyme, and it's possible there might be some strange bacteria that don't have catalase. But every single mammal, fish, vertebrate that we know of has the enzyme catalase. It's a very common enzyme, and its whole purpose is to break down hydrogen peroxide, to break it into oxygen and into water. So that's why yeast has that enzyme, and we do too. That's why it will bubble if you put it on a scrape. It must be pretty common if they actually named it catalase because that sounds a lot like catalyst. Um, it does sound a lot like catalyst. So it is a, a point of confusion for some students when they're like, wait, catalyst? Catalase is a catalyst? And <laughs> write that down really quick. So we have catalase, which is the name of a specific enzyme. And almost all enzymes have a name that ends in ace. And this enzyme is a type of catalyst. So catalyst can be can be almost anything that speeds a reaction up. Catalase is a specific type of enzyme. And I think the fact that we told folks in the live stream here that we were going to have you have us sing a song that they wanted afterwards, I think that totally has distracted everybody in the live stream because all I'm seeing is song requests. But I will say. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I know if we play music that's copyrighted, that can get us into trouble. So I actually went back to yesterday's video and I clipped out Math Dad singing Let It Go. So that's not there anymore because I didn't want YouTube to flag the video and take it down. But if we sing something like What Does the Fox Say? And that's a copyrighted song. If we're not using the music, but we're singing all the words, does that count as a copyright violation? I'm not sure. I need to look it up. So no, I think we're okay there. We're not using someone else's version of the song. I don't think we're allowed to sing. Are we allowed to sing it? Yeah. I'm not 100% sure. And so for today, I think we should pick royalty-free public domain songs. I have two that I know of. One is Baba Black Sheep, 
And the other one is Mare Seed Oats. If, if you haven't heard that one before, it's a fun little tongue twister. I love singing when I was a kid. Mare Seed Oats and Oats Seed Oats and Little Lamb Seed Ivy. A kiddly divey too, wouldn't you? So let's have one more suggestion for a copyright free song and then we'll let you guys vote. So I'm seeing Roxanne, I'm seeing Duck Song a lot. We will look, we, I, will, I will investigate the Duck Song. Is the Duck Song royalty free? That's like just like a cute little thing on YouTube. I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Mm -hmm. Duck Song. How long can people withstand zero gravity in outer space? Um, the longest time that someone's been on the International Space Station. So assuming that you're on a space station, not like in outer space. Because if you're actually in the vacuum of space, we're talking seconds. You have seconds to be alive before you die. A vacuum is a really bad environment for a human being. But International Space Station, we've had astronauts who have been up there for over a year. Several. Several have had missions there that have been longer than a year. And they do have some effects that are... When they get back down to Earth, they've usually lost calcium in their bones, like their bones have gotten weaker, and there are other effects that... Um, there were actual changes to their DNA from... Yeah, you have increased radiation in space, too. So space travel is no, is no small thing. There are a lot of challenges with space travel. All right, the duck song, I think... Oh, it is copyrighted from Tudencore Incorporated. <laughs> yeah. We'll we'll do um Mersey Dotes. Mersey Dotes. You're probably gonna have to explain this song. We'll, we'll, we'll sing it once and then we can explain it. Mersey Dotes, Baba Black Sheep. What's another good song that's that you know is like royalty free? Like a classic, like nursery rhyme song. Can you think of one? I, I know a good one. It goes like this. I'm singing a song, I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. <laughs> that was not the song that I was talking about. How about um, <laughs> how about row, row, row your boat? Okay, so we've got three for you to vote on. Row, row, row your boat is one of them. And in the chat, you can vote real quick, and then we will sing one of these songs. And after we're done, I will investigate whether we can sing things like the duck song and where does the shark, shark say. All right, so enter so, either a one, a two, or a three, depending one, on which one you vote for. One for Baba Black Sheep, two for Mersey Dotes, and three for Row, Row, Row Your Boat. And if you're disappointed because those sound like simple songs, I promise you Math Dad's going to make them cool. <laughs> All right, go ahead and put your vote in the chat, and let's see, let's see which one wins. Two. I'm seeing mostly twos. Oh, two by a long shot. Yeah, okay. All right, do you remember this one? Yeah, I remember this one. All right, should I sing it with you? Sing it together, we'll do duet. All right, all right. All right. Yeah. Mare's dotes and dozy dotes, dotes and little lambs eat ivy. A kiddly divey too, too, wouldn't you? Oh, mare's dotes, dotes and dozy dotes, dotes and little lambs eat ivy. A kiddly divey too, wouldn't you? If the words sound queer and funny to your ear, a little bit jumbled and jivey. Sing mares eat oats, and does eat oats, and little lambs eat ivy. I never learned that part. You never learned that part? No, no. That's like the best part. That tells you how to sing the song. Yeah, I never got it. But... All, right, All right, now really fast. Oh. Oh. Mares eat oats, and does eat oats, and little lambs eat ivy. I can eat ivy too, wouldn't you? We can do it faster. So yeah, it, it sounds like this, this nonsense song. I, I think my grandma had sung this thing for years, and I, I, I really just thought it was a nonsense song. And then all of a sudden, one day, it hit me. <gasps> there are actually words in that song. It's so talking about mares eat oats, and does eat oats, and little lambs eat ivy. A, a kid, kid will like, eat ivy too. Not a kid person, but a baby goat kid. Kid will eat ivy too, wouldn't you? Don't eat ivy. It's poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have a request for faster. You think you can do it faster? As fast as you can, Math Dad. Mary's right, Dose and Dose. Let's change the pitch there. Mary's Dose and Dose. Dose and Little Lambs eat ivy. A kid will eat ivy too, wouldn't you? That's a fun one. And it's a classic. That song, like I said, our both of us remember our grandparents singing that song. I remember my mom singing that song when I was a kid. So it's been around for a long time. Yeah. I tell you, 
turn on the oldies station and you, you'll find some some great old music. They they knew what they were doing back in the day. But you know, it is different than a lot of the music we have now, but really yeah. fun. We're we're getting some great suggestions for other songs, and like I said, we will look up copyright things and see if we can do like. Um, yeah, I, I guess we, we've been singing Baby Shark. We probably would be fine with what does the fox say, but I, I want to look it up just to be sure. All right. Yeah, so as long as we're not playing someone else's music, I, I, think, I think we're, we're okay. How about Baba Black Sheep? Can you do some cool arpeggios? Well, we, we could try it. So, so an interesting thing. Uh, so I saw somebody suggesting Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star, and then we got Baba Black Sheep, and we also have like the alphabet song. All three of them are the same song. They are, same tune. And some people say that Mozart came up with that tune. He actually didn't. It had spin around even longer. It was a popular tune before him, but he sort of popularized it by doing a slight variation with it, and it's been around ever since. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, ba, ba, black sheep, have you any wool? Yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. One for the master, one for the dame, and one for the little boy who lives down the lane. Ba, ba, black sheep, have you any wool? Yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. And that's the same tune as Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star? Yep, and, let's do... and also the alphabet. All right, let's so... do that one next. More arpeggios. I love, I love your arpeggios. Twinkle. Yep. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Thank you for joining us today in this episode of Quarantine. And I, I always feel at the end like I want to turn it around just because I have to tell you, like being a YouTuber and making videos as my as my living, the fact that our lighting is bad and we're using a webcam just kind of makes my heart sad sometimes <laughs> because the lighting when we're by the board is terrible and this is a little bit better. So we bid you farewell. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Quarantine. And like I said, we, let us know what you think about the two hour format because we're thinking in the future if we sort of break things up where it's simpler on the first one and then more complex on the second one we go deeper, that might work well. And then also keep those song requests coming because that was that was fun. And Math Dad's a real good sport. I kind of sprung that on him yesterday with no warning whatsoever. And he did a great job. It's a rough life. <laughs> Stay safe and have fun. We'll see you. Slowly.